I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I'm going to talk about how a lot of people, or what you need to consider when you're looking for a plan B. There's a lot that can go wrong in life, and a lot of people, especially those living in North America or Europe these days, are thinking about where they might need to go in case things go sideways, we'll say. There's a lot of reasons why you may want to look for an alternative living location, a place that you can go to rapidly and have some flexibility in where you're going to live and how you're going to live your life. So living here in Latin America, this is a region that has a lot of plan B potential, let's call it. So let's talk about how a plan B decision situation may play out for you. We're going to get to that on today's show. I started walking and I, I turned down a random side road in the middle of the countryside. I have absolutely no idea where I'm going. I have a very rough idea of where I am. I think I'm headed north and I'm just on some little dirt path thing, but there is power lines going along one side and there's clearly ruts for tires that I'm walking on. It seems kind of like a road. We're gonna find out. It's more than a lot of roads that I see on Google Maps. So uh, I'm feeling feeling about 80% on this particular path. All right, so plan Bs. Now in another episode, probably a few months ago, we talked about how a lot of people were thinking that they needed residency in a place like Nicaragua as a hedge against wherever they're stuck living today. It doesn't matter where you are, or what part of the world you're in, that it's you may want to move to another country in case things go haywire wherever you are. It could be it could be weather related, it could be job related, it could be uh, investment or market related, it could be war related. There's a lot of reasons that you may need to go somewhere else. So those are things that it's good for anyone to consider. And I talked a bit about how my family had maintained, I'm going uphill a bit here, so sorry. So I started coughing and wheezing all at once. It was terrible. So this is actually a really beautiful spot. I'm Now I'm completely sure this was the right way to walk. Nice. So. In, in that episode, we talked about why you might need, there's just so many reasons. And I talked about why we had a plan when we lived in Texas, when we lived in Dallas, that we could head out to uh, Monterey and make our way south through Mexico and head to Central America or even stay in Mexico if that's what we needed to do very easily. And that is something that we had planned out in a lot of different ways so that we would be completely ready for whatever might happen. When you live in Texas, Mexico is the obvious place that you need to head. Going to Canada would be all but impossible. In just in case anything actually went wrong. We're talking about things that make you need to leave your country, obviously. And we had a pretty well thought out plan B, C, D, and so forth, but everything involved heading down through Monterey, there was pretty much a funnel that you had to go through. So if you're living abroad and you're looking at Latin America as being your plan B infrastructure, let's talk a little bit about what you could do, what you could consider, and how easy or hard that might be. But while we're doing that, I'm gonna get some shots of this absolutely gorgeous location that I'm in because, wow, this is a beautiful country location that I, I, if you're into countryside like me, this is just amazing. Latin America makes a great plan B region because it is very accessible. It is a region with a lot of diversity, a lot of different national options. So you are not restricted by what a single country is going to offer. It has a relatively decent safety rating. Of course, it's not the best, uh, but it is not terrible. Depending on where you go, you have flexibility to be in very safe areas or moderately safe areas. You could opt to be in very dangerous areas, but generally you're gonna not opt to do that. Uh, uh, and it's almost entirely quite affordable. There are a few very expensive places within the region, such, such as Costa Rica or southern Brazil, but by and large, you have a lot of very affordable options all throughout, from very far north in North America, northern Mexico, to the southern tips of Chile and Argentina. You have tropical, subtropical, temperate, and even, you know, Antarctic zones, pretty much. You have so many options as far as climate and national options, uh, cost of living, big cities, very rural, like here in Nicaragua. There's just, there's just so much diversity within a region where you have a certain cultural uh, familiarity throughout the region. So very importantly, if you were to live in Latin America, 
and not necessarily as a plan B, possibly as a plan A, one of the great things about it is the amount of diversity you get without needing to leave the region. So you have this flexibility of, especially if you learn the language and especially if you learn the two, Spanish and Portuguese, uh, that you're able to move around very simply throughout an incredibly large region and leverage resources from across the entire ecosystem uh, very fluidly in a way that very few parts of the world are able to do. If you were to live in Africa, for example, you would have a similarly physically sized area, a little bit larger, uh, with access to even more countries, but the diversity between those countries is high enough that it creates uh, linguistic and cultural barriers that can make it a little bit difficult to move between them. Of course, that also adds a lot of interest, and you can move between very di disparate regions with relatively little distance, but it also comes with even more danger but an even lower cost of living, uh, but the flexibility of a lot of border crossings gets much harder. So Africa, while it does offer some of the benefits of South America and Central America, uh, does have some caveats for sure and makes it much more difficult. And especially uh, coming from most of the places where my audience is who are looking for a plan B or wanna have that plan in mind, South America and Central America and Mexico tend to offer incredibly easy options for you to come very quickly. You don't need to plan ahead for pretty much anywhere. Whereas for much of Africa, you would need to plan ahead. You need to have a visa, you need to have your paperwork in order, you need to have permission or whatever. It's not 100% true, especially if you're coming from the United States. We tend to have a lot of uh, places that we can travel to quite easily, but Africa is definitely a lot harder, both in distance for most people, unless you're coming from Europe, uh, and in the whole visa and passport and coordination thing. It just doesn't have the tourist infrastructure or the national mobility infrastructure that Latin America has. <laughs> I'm gonna do my best to do this video with the sun directly behind me. It's a little bit challenging, but it is a beautiful spot out here and I'm loving the view. I've got sugarcane right next to me. I've got some open fields back there. I've got some mountains, uh, actually a volcano just behind me. Cerro um, Sarah de Oro is right behind me and it's just a gorgeous day. There is a lot of wind though, so we're gonna have to start and stop depending on how much wind there is. If you look closely over here, there's actually a horse hanging out in this field. It's so random. All right, so let's start in the north. Mexico is the most obvious choice for most people coming from North America. It is super close and it's super big. It is a giant country. So its ability to absorb people and take, whether you're a refugee or just an expat looking for a different life, it can take a lot of people. It ranges in cost. Right now it's a lot more expensive than it is traditionally, but it is uh, very affordable and depending on where you wanna be. If you wanna be in Mexico, city, of course, your prices go way up. If you want to be in Cancun, it's ridiculously expensive. But if you want to be in rural Mexico, you want to explore your options. It has a lot of very affordable areas. South of Mexico, this is where we are. This is Central America, or specifically the CA4, Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. This is one of the optimum plan B regions because the cost of living here is so incredibly low and you get four national jurisdictions within a single border zone. That gives you a little bit more flexibility than you're gonna get in Mexico. Mexico does allow, normally, Americans to come in with very little paperwork, but it does require more paperwork at the border, and it does require some declarations, and staying beyond six months is a little bit more complicated. Completely doable. I don't wanna dismiss Mexico in any way. It is a very viable location for people coming from North America or Europe, so definitely consider it. But if you're looking for the easiest options, Central America is probably going to be your absolute easiest. They are essentially as close as Mexico, especially once you're bothering to get on a plane, unless you're going to drive over the border, then obviously Mexico has the advantage of being the only place you can drive to over the border from North America. Uh, but if you're looking at very simple flights, <clears throat> then Central America is going to be essentially unbeatable. It's the lowest cost of living region in all of Latin America, and it has the most national jurisdictions within the smallest area. It has some of the safest countries around, like Nicaragua and El Salvador, and it has uh, a lot of it has big cities, like San Salvador and Guatemala City, it has small cities, it has rural regions. It really offers a bit of everything within a relatively small area, uh, including very high safety and the least paperwork for someone coming in. There's nowhere, including Mexico, that is as easy for North Americans to go to as Central America. So this region really does shine as a plan B, and that's partially why here on a Nicaragua show we're talking about it, because this is something that people who are looking at plan Bs and looking at Nicaragua are gonna, in that Venn diagram, they're gonna overlap quite a lot. 
I had to move. It was just entirely too windy to be able to do the show. So moving south of the CA-4, we have Costa Rica, or you could call it the CA-5. Costa Rica is in many ways related to the other four countries in Central America that we mentioned. There's also Belize. If you need a place that's going to speak English primarily, then Belize is your option. It is, however, a very small country. So while it's very affordable, uh, it does have some safety concerns, and it is an incredibly tiny population. So if you're simply moving on your own, you're looking for a place for retirement, that type of place be, that's going to be fine. If you're looking for a place that's able to take a large number of ref refugees in case of a true emergency, then Belize is going to be overwhelmed very quickly. Its infrastructure just won't be able to take very many people, being the smallest country in the region by no small margin. It might as well be a Caribbean island given its population. Costa Rica, however, is a large country uh, similar to Nicaragua in population, smaller but similar, but it has a very high cost of living. So while very accessible for Americans or Canadians who are going to come down, need to get there very quickly, or you're Europeans. You don't have a lot of paperwork. You can just enter the country. You can stay for a long time. It's very flexible. It isn't as flexible as the CA4, but its cost of living is so much higher that that presents a potential barrier for people who may need to move someplace and live for quite some time, possibly permanently. It's a major commitment to move into a country where the cost of living is similar to North America, certainly lower at this time, but it's very high and you will not have the massive cost saving benefits that you generally see throughout most of Latin America. And if you're looking at a plan B, in most cases, cost of living is going to be a significant factor. Because if you're in an emergency, you may be looking at any uh, investments or funds or income that you had previously may dry up or alter or be reduced. And those are things you want to consider that you may need to make a life for yourself on reduced uh, financial situation uh, quite quickly. It all depends what plan B means to you. But that is an area that uh, well worth considering if you're able to afford it, then it can be a great option, especially for those who don't really want to have to move into the region, but may feel that they are forced to, then Costa Rica is going to offer a little bit more feeling of being closer to home than you will get. It'd be less exotic, basically, than anything else uh, in, the, in Latin America uh, from the U.S. The only other places that would be on par in any way be Argentina and Chile, and really they're going to feel very modern and European, but they're not going to feel as American as Costa Rica is. Going on south from Costa Rica, or technically going east, East is Panama. Panama is also relatively expensive, but not as expensive as Costa Rica. It is much smaller, but still much larger than Belize, and does offer quite a bit of options for someone looking for a plan B. Now, if you're looking simply as a lifestyle change rather than an emergency change, then Panama could be a really good option. Panama offers a very South American experience, but closer to North America. And that can be a nice benefit, something that if you don't like Central America culturally or uh, from a food or whatever perspective, Panama may offer you something that's a little bit different while being just as close. Panama has big cities, still has countryside, has relatively low cost of living areas, has a lot of waterfront if that's something that you're looking for. But having Panama City, a major airport, uh, and, and that really urban feeling can be really important for a lot of people. So Panama can be a very special place. Panama tends to be far more international than anywhere else that we've talked about. Of course, Mexico City is going to be very international. Uh, of course, uh, Costa Rica is pretty international, but Costa Rica leans towards a tourism international feeling, whereas Panama is more of business international, uh, people who are living there from, from more different locations and less on just North Americans and Europeans who are vacationing there. So it is a very different feeling from Costa Rica, even though it shares a lot of aspects and they neighbor each other. And and of course, again, just like the CA4, you're in a region where things are very close to each other. So even if you don't want to fly and you just want to drive by car, you're able to move between a lot of these countries very easily. And that's a very important thing. When you're looking at plan Bs, you may not be in a position to qualify for long-term residency, or you may not want to qualify for long-term residency, or you just may need some flexibility to shift between countries. If you're in Mexico, that can be a little bit difficult because to one direction you still have the United States and in the other you have a potentially very long way to go before you reach Guatemala and essentially only Guatemala, Belize technically, but you have very limited international border options. Whereas in the middle of uh, Central America, you can move in multiple directions and have a lot of different jurisdictions and a very small area. And people often find that to be very powerful, especially when you're talking about a plan B, that you're not locked into any one particular country logistically. If you have a car or can get on a bus or just want to take flights, you can, with very little money, very little time, and very little effort, shift between seven different countries, potentially eight if you're going to include uh, Mexico, 
uh, move around uh, with, with a lot of flexibility and options. And sometimes shifting between countries is exactly what you want, because in doing so, that can allow you to bypass uh, time restrictions in a country. Uh, Panama will give you 180 days, for example, but at the end of that 180 days, you can move to Costa Rica and get another 180 days. You don't feel like going back to Panama, you can move on to Nicaragua, get another 180 days. And then only after that, decide, do you want to go back to Costa Rica or Panama or move on to Belize or Mexico and get another 180 days? As most of the countries, I don't know about Belize, but all the others will give you 180 days. That's a lot. You're talking about years without having to even repeat a country or get on a plane. All of that is within driving distance in a very small area, and it doesn't include all the variety you could get in the countries that are within the border control zone of Nicaragua, which we'll talk about in some other episode of the CA4, but that's, that's powerful and all super close to North America and relatively close to like Europe if you're getting flights. So that's, for a plan B, really hard to beat that you can get to it really quickly and you have a lot of protection over a long period of time to figure things out. And often with a plan B, if it's more than a retirement plan B, if you're looking at an emergency situation where you just have to shift your life somewhere, it gives you years to figure out what to do instead of months. And that can be the thing that makes all the difference, all with relatively little effort. You get into the zone with no effort. You're there in hours. You don't need any paperwork to get in. You can figure things out once you're on the ground that that can be the plan B factor that trumps everything. On Google Maps, I'm on a road that is so remote that it shows no houses and the road going nowhere. I'm, I'm essentially at the end of the road. Yet there is continuous traffic out here. There wasn't for a while, but it's starting to pick up and a couple trucks have gone by, several motorcycles, a few bicycles. There has to be people who live somewhere out here. There's so many people coming and going down this road, but on the map, there's no town, no connecting road, no houses, no nothing. Just one Finca that I just walked past and that is it. So I have no idea, buenas. I have no idea what's going on out here. This is this is the stuff I love about Nicaragua and a lot of Latin America. It's so unpredictable. You walk down a dirt road in the middle of nowhere that Google Maps says goes nowhere, does nothing, has nothing, and suddenly you're in beautiful spots. That goes without saying. And it kind of feels like autumn to me. If you look at, I'm gonna turn around and try to get the sun a little bit good here. I'm gonna turn around. Look at this, like some of this, like brown and stuff, it feels like, kind of mid-autumn, like a really warm Indian summer in the United States. I got a nice breeze, I'm not like super hot, so it doesn't feel like summer summer, but as a location, there's a lot of like the leaves are falling and some of this stuff feels like New York, the way that it, it looks out here. Like it's such an interesting spot as if, if you were to drop me here on a day like this and I'm just walking, there's a part of me that would really struggle to figure out that I'm in Central America and not much farther north, maybe, uh, rural Virginia or something, North Carolina. So as we head on to our other options, we're heading on to South America. South America offers a lot of really great countries with great plan B potential. However, they tend to be pretty far away. Getting to and from most places, whether it's Europe or North America, can be quite daunting. And so it depends on your scenario. But they do have a lot of cool places. But most of these countries are much larger than the ones in Central America. And so the distance between things is obviously much farther and that can make things more complicated. Plus there isn't the shared border zones in most cases and for North Americans and sometimes Europeans there's a few barriers to entry such as Brazil does require some planning ahead, Bolivia requires a $160 visa on arrival. There's just some things that make it a little bit harder that you're not going to just border hop left and right all the time and most of these countries are only going to offer 90 days I believe. There aren't very many offering the big 180 day packages that that you typically get in Central America and Mexico. That's not to say that you can't make South America work and that it isn't a great option. It has a lot of potential and a lot of those countries are going to give you options for longer stays. It's just a little bit less obvious and less common. So if you're going to be looking at those, you just need to plan a little bit more and look at which ones are going to make sense for you. In the north, we have the obvious choice of Colombia, and this is going to be probably the top pick for people looking at South America today. It's been, for people coming from North America, a top pick for a long time, so this should be no surprise to anybody. It's a large country that's very low cost of living, has giant cities, lots of countryside, Pacific waterfront, Caribbean waterfront. It is much bigger than people realize, uh, and it has a lot more to offer. It does have very safe regions. It also has some pro some areas with problems. So you're going to want to be a little bit careful, but with a little bit of uh, just common sense and planning ahead, Colombia is easily your number one pick in South America. 
Venezuela in the long run has been a good pick, but right now is a problematic location and probably not where you're going to want to go as a plan B. If you're looking at Venezuela, if you have any interest in it at all, very likely it's not going to be as a retirement destination. It is not going to be as a emergency. I'm running away from somewhere else location. It is going to be a I'm an investor or I'm an adventure traveler and I want to do something off the beaten path and, you know, check out a part of the world that people are staying away from. And I would love to go to Venezuela. I really want to go and film and take you guys with me. Um, I'm hoping that that's going to be in the cards in the coming year or two, but that's that's a long shot. Uh, but I do have some reasons why I might be able to go. Uh, I mean, I can go, right? It's But um, I, there's some reasons that I may, it may be able to play out for me. So I'm hoping that we can, we can possibly get there. But in general, it's not going to be on your list for this. In the same vein, Ecuador is currently crossed off that list. Traditionally, now I know you're going to say, you're going to be like, Scott, Ecuador? This is like a top, you know, retirement destination. This is like the Central American country in South America. What could be a better fit? And in general, you'd be right. But Ecuador has run into a lot of problems, is incredibly unsafe, and even rather adventurous travelers that I know who are South American live very nearby and would blend in and, and be able to pass as local. Even they say they're unwilling to spend time there. They're not going to cross the border. They're certainly not going to drive their cars into it. And so, yeah, if they're wary about it, you need to be super wary about it. I'm not saying that you couldn't vacation there, you couldn't do some adventure travel there, but you need to be pretty cautious and and using it as a plan B is very different than using it for a vacation where you can just pack up and go at a moment's notice. And a plan B, you're in potentially looking at it as a place to live and you don't want to be tied to a place that's going to have a lot of problems. While we're out here, I'm going to turn the camera around and just show where we are because this is a cute little spot. That barn is so old North US style barn. Like that looks like it could be something out of, you know, an old... Uh, New York, Pennsylvania back road location. That's not at all what I was expecting to to stumble across out here. And this country lane that just keeps on going, we're off the Google Maps now. We're past the end of what Google says is a road. And yet there's a full blown road here. Sometimes Google shows places that are just a footpath and calls it a road. This is like an actual road that's well maintained. This is much nicer than many of the roads that we take different times. It's a dirt road, yeah, but it's a really nice one. It's wide, it's comfortable, it's flat, it's hardly any potholes. This is way better than some of the main city roads, such as if you're looking at a map, Leon has a road that connects it directly out to La Paz Centro. That's two major cities connected directly from one to another. That road is so much worse than this one. I, I don't, this one's not even on the map. I don't, what the heck, Google? Come on, get it together. Okay, oh, by the way, this was brought up, <laughs> we're gonna have an aside here. Uh, this was brought up uh, by someone um, that uh, Google doesn't have the little yellow guy, Street View here in Nicaragua. And they said, oh, uh, the, the, the conclusion is Nicaragua must not let them. That is not at all the case. If you weren't allowed to do that, I wouldn't be allowed to do the show. If Google wanted to have street view of every single inch of Nicaragua, all they have to do is pull my video and put it on top of things. I understand that that would take a lot of work. I'm not saying Google should put in that effort, but all Google would have to do is contact me and be like, Scott, we want to walk the whole country and film every single street. I'd be like, I'm already doing that. Why don't you just give me a camera? They'd be like, cool, here you go. And you'd have higher quality, slower moving footage than anywhere else in the world, it would be the best, right? Literally, we could do that. I'm already filming everywhere that way. So it's not a problem from a what's allowed perspective. It's that Google doesn't want to, and for good reason, doesn't want to invest in a car that's going to be put in Nicaragua and drive around just so you can get street views. That stuff's super expensive and they have to, you know, license things and hire people and move cars around. And there's just, there's a lot that goes into that. And, uh, Nicaragua is just not a big market. There's a lot of the world that doesn't have street views. So don't be surprised that Nicaragua is not on the list. Uh, but yeah, certainly you can go out and take all those street views and create that if you want to. It's just someone has to pay to do that. And Google so far has not paid to do that. Google has not yet fully mapped the country. That's way more important than having street views. So it's not surprising at all that they don't have street views yet. That's got a long ways away. I've been down here driving around using Google Maps for nine years and it has improved a lot but like the road I'm on, this is still missing. I personally know many roads that Google doesn't have. Google often has its one ways backwards. There's all kinds of things that are missing. Back when I was here nine years ago, they would direct you to bridges that have never existed, like crazy stuff. So it's improved. It mostly works now, but 
it is nothing like you're used to in North America or Europe, where every street is perfectly accurate, every little thing is there. It's not like that. There aren't people out here creating continuously updated maps for Google, and so its information gets outdated really quickly. It's really easy to have misinformation on it. There's kind of a cool path through the woods here. I have no idea if this is intentional or not. I just got to show it. see Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore hiding down there like that's that's the kind of place and uh, so so Google needs to invest very heavily in in mapping the country long before they're going to invest in street views that's just how that's going to work so all right back to South America now that we're past the old Grand Colombia countries we can talk about the middle of South America and that's primarily Peru Bolivia Paraguay and Brazil. These countries are often going to be a little bit lower on your list as a plan B. They're all perfectly optional, and probably of all of them, Paraguay may be the one that gets the most interest, just because it's the lowest cost of living, it's the most like Central America, uh, and is probably going to be the easiest if you're looking at a long-term living situation. They're the most likely to be able to take you, and the most likely where you could get citizenship, which may be important in a plan B scenario. Bolivia is certainly an option. A lot of North Americans do move there, but it requires a lot more paperwork it has some cost to get in it's less popular less well known and it's a smaller country than most of the others i do love bolivia i was there recently and it was absolutely fantastic it would be a no question if i needed to live in bolivia i would love to do so uh, i was there with alan and anna who just got married we talked about their wedding on the show a little bit congratulations to them uh they were down there they absolutely fell in love with it while we were there too i mean immediately they were like why we could consider living here this is fantastic right so that to, for that to be an immediate reaction by everybody says a lot about a country, especially one that's so far afield, so exotic, so different. Peru is a giant country and has a lot to offer. It has low cost of living, high cost of living, wild countryside, giant cities. It has really everything. Mountains and waterfront and dry areas and jungles. And so Peru really has a lot of possibility. It's generally pretty safe. It does have some, some issues, but it's not terrible. Uh, it did have some problems recently, but that's mostly past. And uh, overall, it's relatively accepting to people visiting and, and staying long term. So it's certainly an option. Brazil, if you're coming from like Canada or Europe, is probably if you're coming from Canada or Europe is probably a really good option. Brazil, if you're coming from Canada or Europe, is probably a really good option. If you're coming from the U.S., it, of course, it remains an option, but it's a lot more tricky. Brazil's relationship with the United States is not as warm and cozy as it has been in the past, and these things ebb and flow, so it's not too big of a worry, and it tends to be quite a bit more expensive, at least in areas where most people who are looking for a plan B would be interested in living. For example, in the uh, Florianopolis area, it gets quite expensive, and in most of southern uh, Brazil and in the major cities. Buenas. And so for a lot of people, Brazil can be a little bit tricky. It's such a giant economy. It has uh, cities with high cost of living just because there's so many people working in such a large economy. So that typically happens. But there's a lot of Brazil that remains very affordable, but you're going to get very remote and be living in a very different Brazil than you generally picture. But that's fine. We're talking about that in all these countries. They have areas that are high cost and low cost. So Brazil's not any different, but its high cost areas are much larger and encompass much bigger swaths of the country, sometimes swaths larger than entire other countries countries. Then we have the Southern Cone. This is going to be a very attractive area for a lot of Plan Bers. That's what I'm going to start calling people. Plan Bers. Uh, the Southern Cone, Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay has a lot of really cool options. It's a large area. You have a lot of land to deal with. You have a lot of climatic zones because they go north-south so far and they start south of the equator. Brazil has fewer climatic zones because the equator runs through the middle of it, so its zones to the south are duplicated to the north for the most part, so you get two of everything but not as much variety overall depending on how you look at it. All right, we've gone so far on this road. Before we dig into the southern cone, that this road now goes in two directions. Keep in mind, Google has none of this. So there's this road behind me, which has multiple people coming down it. And then we have this road over here behind me. Buenas, that people are heading down. There's apparently communities connected on this road and it doesn't even exist on Google Maps. That's, that's wild. So we've walked far enough that we've discovered whole new areas. And now I'm gonna stop and take a moment to look at a map and let the camera cool down. While I decide which way I gotta go.
I've actually walked so far that I can hear the distant sounds of the city of Leon in this direction. So I've gone a crazy far distance and my feet really want to keep exploring. This area is beautiful. I mean, I love the woods and I love countryside and I love these little lanes that just disappear. And sometimes this gives me the feeling of like, I don't know, rural England or something. And uh, when I was in Europe, I did a lot of exploring and very out of the way locations. It's so much fun. And of course, I always did that growing up in America, but my brain is telling me I am many miles away from home and the sun is going to be setting on somewhat rough terrain that I don't know at all. And uh, if I'm not careful, I could be lost on roads that do not exist on Google Maps, which means while I have perfectly good internet signal out here and I'm able to upload videos and I'm still talking to people on chat, I'll just show there's another, there's like a, a branch and going down here, but I am dangerously far away from home. And uh, sometimes you just gotta get home while there's still light. It is. 527 and uh that means i have a little bit but i'm about four miles from home i don't need to do all of that before the sun goes down but i do need to do this part of it for sure so i'm heading back a little bit uh, a little bit sad that i didn't get to go farther i really need to like get up at 3 a.m get a couple miles under my belt when it's nice and cool still dark and that way i have the rising sun I have beautiful light to do lots of recording and uh, lots of exploring all day i also need to bring money with me now this trip there's not a single spot that i went in all these miles so i'm going to do about eight miles by the time i'm back home and at no point will i've passed a shop that's not true right next to my house there's a shop but it's so close i could have brought water from the house to go that far it doesn't really help anything what you need is when you're on these long trips is to go past the pulperia so you can pick up a gatorade or something all right it makes all the difference but i don't uh, i don't have a pulperia on this particular trip i do know how i could find one if i was going to go for a really long time i know where i could diverge a little bit and of course if i kept walking forward likely within the next three miles I would come to one but I don't have any money with me so even if I stumbled on one it's not going to do me any good at this point but boy it is such a beautiful time to go for a walk it's nice nice temperature like it's comfortable and the sun is low and all the light is just beautiful and I'm going to turn the camera around because there's this gorgeous tree and this little lane going up this is another direction I need to explore later Hopefully on the video you guys were able to make out the tractor and the chickens on the lane. It was perfect timing. I didn't know the tractor was there when I brought the camera up and he came around the corner as I pressed record, so couldn't have asked for a better moment than that. <sighs> this has been such a good walk and I've needed this. You know, two years ago I broke my foot and that took me a, over a year for it to heal to a point where I could really just get out and walk again. And of course a year, two years without walking has been, you know, it's tough on me. This is, I'm getting older and I need this, you know, low impact chances to go out and exercise. I, I get a little bit of exercise. I always go walk. I do things, but these longer walks, I really need them and I still feel good. Like I'm able to do this. I don't feel like I've actually gone anywhere at all. I would like a Gatorade, but beyond that, like this is nothing and uh, being you know I'm gonna be 48 here this month and uh, you know it's important that I stay limber and and keep keep mobile right keep uh, going out and doing stuff and I have so many projects and things that I want to do that involve doing so much walking I got to get back into like full-on walking shape where I can just go anywhere anytime as long as I want and uh, got to do this to do it so we're gonna be working on that more and more. That was part of my New Year's resolution and this is me making sure that we make good on that. January was tough. We're in February. We did some in January, we're doing more. And this is the longest walk I've done in quite some time. Feels great, it's a beautiful day. And so we're back to the Southern Cone. So Argentina of these countries really is attractive right now because it's super low cost. Their current economic situation has made it very, very affordable to be there. And so even people who are in South America in other parts of South America are sometimes moving to Argentina to take advantage of the lower cost of living if they can find work back in their home country or better yet abroad from like the US. That can be a really great combination. Now because of the economic problems in Argentina there are a lot of issues. There's some amount of crime, not too much, but that's a little bit you do have to be worried about that you weren't previously before all their uh, their economic collapse happened. And the bigger problem is moving money around, getting money into Argentina. Even if you have plenty of money, even if things in Argentina are cheap, physically getting that money sent to Argentina can be a real challenge. So be aware of that and plan that you can only, I'm a little bit out of breath because I've been hiking hard, 
plan that you need to accommodate how you're going to move money into Argentina for yourself before you go. You can't take big you know, wads of cash. Um, and you certainly can't take enough to live on indefinitely, right? Uh, you can't often get from the ATM. Uh, a lot of exchange rates are really bad if you're not careful. So you really need to, you know, do your research and know exactly where you can do good exchanges. That's going to move from time to time. You need to know what money you can move in, how much you can get, uh, where it's going to go. You just have to have a plan. And that's more than I can guide you on at this point. I do have employees in Argentina and Valentina, who helps with the show. Uh, she is going to be moving to Argentina in about two weeks. So that's really exciting. She's going to have a lot of feedback for us from down there. And, uh, and she is from Mexico, so she has a very good perspective from the region. And she's been to Argentina before, but this is her first time living there. So that's super cool. And, uh, and she's been on the show before. Uh, and uh, so Argentina, boy, it offers so much opportunity, but it requires a lot of logistical management. That's the real thing. If you're up for a challenge, but not like a scary challenge, just like a lot of work, Argentina probably has just about more to offer than almost anywhere else in the world right now. And so for especially Latin America, it is really shining. It would be hard not to pick it unless you just can't deal with all those logistics because that really is hard like seriously you will every moment you're living in Argentina be challenged by those things until they go away so be prepared for that for sure Chile and Uruguay are going to present a completely different scenario. Both of these countries are economically doing really well. They're very stable and they're going to give you much more of a European feel. Both of them are sometimes accused of being the Switzerland of South America. It's weird that both of them are and probably both of them are larger than Switzerland. Nah, not really. Uruguay is not actually, but it feels that way sometimes. But those countries are uh, more expensive. So you're definitely not going to get your bang for the buck like you are in most of the rest of, of South America and Latin America in general, but you're going to get a lot of stability, a lot of resources, a lot of just infrastructure uh, and smoothness to the experience. So if you have a little bit more to spend uh, and not quite as much as you would need in a lot of Brazil, then these could be really good options. Of course, they're beautiful countries with a lot of great stuff going on as well. Chile, unfortunately, huge fires in Valparaiso uh, just over the last few days. That's absolutely tragic horrible stuff going on there. But in general, Chile is really, really beautiful. And there, you know, you can get that cold weather like you're often used to in North America. I'm just marveling at the beautiful view of the volcanoes I have out here. It's a little bit of a hazy day and the GoPro makes it really difficult to show them in a distance. So I'm not gonna even bother trying to get a great shot of them. But I now know that this shot is here. It's amazing to me all the years living in Nicaragua. It never stops being just amazing to be walking along and suddenly have an amazing view of volcanoes. I've lived all over the world, but I've never lived in a place that really had just continuous great views of mountains, let alone volcanoes. Volcanoes are a little bit special compared to normal mountains. When I lived in Transylvania, we would see the Carpathians pretty regularly. That was probably the best I've ever had. Uh, when I lived in Crete, lived on the island of Crete in Greece. Uh, we had the islands there on the, the islands, the mountains there on the island. Those are pretty big, they're snow-capped mountains. I lived on a mountain in Spain, so it's not like I've never had mountains, but there's something about the large flat lands of Nicaragua and you're just walking down a country lane and you look over and there are towering volcanoes in the distance and it's like wow and it, and because they're so recognizable they really anchor you to the landscape you're like okay I know what direction things are like I know what I'm looking at all the time because I can always see a volcano somewhere uh and it's it's just amazing so so Chile and Uruguay they are kind of unique um, and would be a little bit more like Mexico in that you can have all the resources, all the amenities. I guess that's what we're really looking for. You want that kind of North American experience where you can have really fancy things. You can have, uh, you know, extensive, just any service you can imagine. They're probably going to be your best for that. Argentina would be like that too, but you have that massive overhead of just trying to get money. Uh, so as long as you have the financial resources for Chile and Uruguay, they're going to be really good considerations. Really, the... The Latin American world is your oyster if you're looking for a plan B. And figuring out where you want to be based to start doesn't mean that that's where you're locked in. You can move around really easily. And maybe having all of Latin America as your plan B is the plan B that you need. It's, it's a powerful tool when you realize that you're not stuck in a single country and you can leverage a region or the world for that matter. Uh, but 
you know, if you're looking at a plan B, presumably there's something causing you to want to escape or retire or whatever to a different area. So you probably don't want to look at the globe as a complete globe trotter dream, but Latin America gives you a regionality that I think very few places do. Europe does to quite some degree. And Latin America does in a different way, but I don't think that anywhere in Africa or Asia, certainly not Australia, definitely not North America, they do not do the same thing. Latin America is really unique in that it gives you a giant region with just two languages. If you skip Brazil, you have a giant region with just one language, but still with 16 or 17 jurisdictions. Add in Brazil and it basically doubles the space and population with only one more language. And it's not that different of a language. It is different. Don't try to pretend the Portuguese and Spanish are the same language. They are not, but uh, it does. If you learn Spanish, you can survive in Brazil without too much trouble, and uh, and they're used to speaking Spanish, they're used to being surrounded by Spanish-speaking countries, and all the countries around them are used to people speaking Portuguese, so there's there's some fluidity there. But it, it is unique that you have a population that is so large, and so many countries, and this kind of shared culture and linguistic uh, family throughout, that you can use the region as a single entity in a way that no other region in the world lets you do. That's really powerful. And when you kind of grasp that and you become part of it and you like live here and you're like, wow, no, like Honduras is just right there and I can just use it. And we just go to Costa Rica, we just use it. And it's like, oh, that's part of our ecosystem. Much like living in the United States, you have all these different states and, uh, but they don't give you just different jurisdictions, which is powerful for, for economics in the US. But when it comes to, oh, well, I don't like how something happens in this country. I don't like how this country handles this, or I don't like the economic situation in this country, or it's too expensive. Well, you have other options. Whereas in the States, well, they're all pretty close, right? Sure, California is more expensive than Mississippi, but they're far more alike than they are different, even though they don't want to admit it. But, the, but Latin America gives you a dramatic amount of variety while having enough similarity to still be able to treat the region as a single thing. So as a plan B, because it's got the safety you need, because it has the low cost of living that many people need, because it has these multiple jurisdictions and this ability to move throughout the region as more of a region than individual entities and hopping between, like it just doesn't have those barriers. I think that Latin America is the ultimate plan B, and you definitely should be looking at it. And you need to be looking across it, not just at Nicaragua. Sure, I picked Nicaragua. I'm very happy with it. It's got a lot going for it. It's a really good starting point if that's where you want to consider that first. But, you know, don't just hone in on one place because what you like, you've got so much tuning that you can do throughout the region. I just want this slightly different. I want a little bit cooler weather. I want a little bit bigger city. I want a little bit larger country. I want a place with trains. We're getting trains and I'm pushing for more. I'm, I am the, the train champion of, uh, of Nicaragua, but we're going we're gonna to see that happen for sure. Oh, what a beautiful sunset is going on right here, right now. I'm going to turn around and get the camera on that, uh, but we'll show that tomorrow. Right now, I want to let you know that if you want to sponsor the channel, you can do so by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That helps make all this possible, helps get me out of the house, out exploring for you guys, getting cool footage, going neat places, finding new spots and uh, all that. Share on social media, tell your friends about the show. Get down in the comments and leave, just say hi if nothing else, but ask your questions. That's how we make content. It's how we know what to cover for future episodes. And as always, I will see all of you in the afternoon tomorrow.